When Raymond Dart published his findings about the Tong child in 1925, he knew he was onto something big. He knew he had found a true missing link in the context of human evolution, something that filled in the gap between the variation we see in living humans and the variation we see in the primate world. What Dart couldn't have anticipated was what would follow his work. Pursued by colleagues like Robert Broom, John Robinson, Bob Brain, and colleagues working in South Africa up to the present, South Africa has been the center of our understanding of human evolution. In many ways, modern paleoanthropology was born in South Africa in the decades following the discovery of the Tong child. Work around Johannesburg and Pretoria uncovered dozens of hominin sites, many of which are still actively worked today, and have produced the largest assemblage of fossil hominins that we know of anywhere in the world. So Dart published The Tong Child in 1925, and by the mid-1930s, his colleague Robert Broom had uncovered a series of fossils at several other localities in the area. Today, this whole region is an area that we know of as designated as the cradle of humankind because of the density of hominin occupations and the richness of the fossil preservation we have from the area. The series geologically is underlaid by a formation of dolomite and limestone, the kind of materials that easily form cracks that expand into crevices that expand into caves, the kind of caves that are potentially good occupying places for hominids, but also places that simply accumulate the remains gathered by scavengers, gathered by natural forces, but are wonderful areas for fossilization. So these caves have been tremendously productive in terms of producing fossil hominids as well as archaeological materials. What we're going to review today are some of those materials. Now it's important to keep in mind that when these materials first began being uncovered in the 1930s and 1940s, they were some of the earliest fossil hominins that we knew of at the time. Our record of fossil hominins, especially older fossil hominins, things predating two million years, was fairly limited back then. So they helped form and establish our basic understanding for patterns of variation in the fossil hominid lineage. To give you some perspective on the richness of fossil finds from this area, this is a picture of the Broom Room, named after Robert Broom, at the Ditsong National Museum located in Pretoria, formerly the Transvaal Museum. And what you see here are shelves that are full with literally hundreds of fossil hominin remains, in addition to thousands of other fossil hominins from these localities. Many of these localities were first discovered during the context of limestone excavations, actually removing blocks of limestone or blasting them out using dynamite. So the preservation on these remains is variable. Many of them are fragmentary. Also, the context in which these specimens fossilized in these caves, a combination of infill, sediment, bones, and other kinds of remains housed under great pressure means that many of these specimens are also warped. The period of fossilization basically distorted what we have left in these specimens so that they are, have undergone various kinds of plastic deformation. Some of them we might affectionately refer to as pancake fossils because they've been essentially been flattened. But nevertheless, the sheer number of fossils provide us a tremendously rich view into what variation looks like in these fossil hominins. The other challenge in interpreting the South African remains is that they're coming out of cave contexts. The sedimentation process that goes into caves, how sediment accumulates, is much more variable than in an open air site, where sediment accumulates fairly regularly and in a fairly horizontal formation. In caves, you have complex patterns of sedimentation, complex patterns of erosion as sediments get washed out by storms. And the geometry of the cave itself can change over time as ceilings collapse, different erosional routes uh, emerge. So one of the challenges in interpreting the remains from South Africa is that they accumulated over a long period of time, perhaps as much as three million years in these caves. And yet, there's a complex stratigraphy that underlies actually where these hominins are within the caves. So one of the earliest challenges was simply figuring out which specimens come from which part of the cave, which specimens are older, which specimens are younger. As you'll see as we look through the morphology, there's a lot of variation housed within these specimens, and getting it in a proper temporal sequence is very important. But moving into the remains, we can first look at the Tong child in more detail. Again, this was the specimen brought to Dart's attention that he argued represented a fundamental missing link between humans and apes, Australopithecus africanus, southern ape of Africa. And the features that he identified that made it so human-like in some ways was this very small, gracile, very vertical face. Now this is a young individual, a very young individual in fact. These are all deciduous dentition that we see in the maxilla here and also in the mandible. So one of the challenges in interpreting what this specimen might have looked like as an adult. But it has a very small gracile face. It has dentition which, if we look at them in more detail here, we can see are very human-like and not very ape-like. We have these small incisors up front. We have a very reduced canine. Even for a deciduous canine, this is a small tooth. And then we have these very large molars. Um, so you can see the large first deciduous molar, 
large second deciduous molar, and an even larger permanent first molar coming into play. So the combination of features that seem to indicate that this was a missing link for DART was the fact that it had a human-like face, human-like dentition, even though it had a very small brain. Again, we have a preserved endocast for this specimen that's very small, ape-like in terms of its size. Now, there's been lots of argument about whether or not the structural aspects of this brain were ape-like. People argue about the external features of the endocast itself, and specifically whether or not the complexity of them suggests some derived features relative to an ape brain, and whether those derived features correspond to more advanced cognitive abilities. But Tong provided the first evidence of this species Australopithecus africanus. Not too long after Dart discovered Tong Child, Broom discovered additional specimens at site, cave sites like Sturkfontein, Swartkrans, and Chromedry that produced an abundant assemblage of not just Australopithecus africanus remains, but other specimens as well. Perhaps the most famous is this specimen here, Sturkfontein 5, STS 5, sometimes referred to affectionately as Mrs. Plez. Now, this specimen is an adult version of the Tong child. We have a very broad face with flaring zygomatics if you look across the midline of the face. Um, you can see in this image a little bit of the projecting anterior lower face associated with still fairly large canine roots. And we have a small supraorbital torus that's double arched here in the front. And we have a fairly small nasal aperture and not much evidence of an external projecting nose. There's not really a bony eminence here in the lower portion. And the nasal bones also don't project out very Far. So it has a very flat, kind of scooped out face with a little bit of subnasal prognathism, very wide zygomatics, again associated probably with a fairly large chewing apparatus. Um, here we can see those images in the side. So again, we see that subnasal prognathism down here in front. We see that big flexed flaring zygomatic. Remember, this is the attachment point for the masseter muscle, one of the big chewing muscles that we use chewing of food. Um, and you can see that it has a relatively small brain size still. The brain case is not particularly large. It doesn't have big, strong muscular development of features, however, on the brain case. We don't see the big kind of sagittal crest that we see in um, some ape species. We don't have a very well-developed nuchal torus. It's fairly mildly developed in this context. Um, you can see that the brow projects out. The gabella, that space between the eyes, is projecting out here as well. So a number of the features that again, correspond with this transitional status. The fact that we have still some primitive features that we might associate with apes, such as the relative brain size, this large masticatory apparatus that's similar to the earlier Australopithecines we talked about from East Africa, Australopithecus afarensis, but also maybe the beginnings of some more derived features as well. STS-5, at this point, we think is dated to roughly two and a half million years in age, so corresponding to about a million years after some of the Australopithecus afarensis species that we've talked about from Hadar from Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Um, here we see the, the vertical view or the superior view of the specimen. You can see there's still significant post-orbital constriction. Uh, this again corresponds to that small brain size of the specimen. One interesting thing is that the specimen was found in two pieces. You might have noticed that in the side view here how the skull cap itself is a separate piece from the rest of the skull. This is in part because of it was excavated out of this very dense cement-like matrix. Uh, now one of the questions that developed is actually in the context of pulling it away from the matrix, some of the external surface of the skull was actually lost. And some researchers have argued that in removing that external surface, they might have actually removed some evidence of a sagittal keel or a sagittal crest, a midline bony structure in the specimen, something that may have indicated that this was a male individual. Now, Traditional interpretations of the specimen have suggested it's female, hence the nickname Mrs. Plez. Um, so if it was in fact a male, although current evidence again is ambiguous on that, that would again change how we interpret the pattern of variation we're seeing in these specimens. Um, but here again we see a sort of an oblique view of STS-5, and again you can see that broad, almost scooped out face a little bit here, uh, with a mild superorbital torus, that projecting gabella, subnasal prognathism projecting out this way towards the jaw and the maxillary dentition. Now this specimen gives us a great view of what the Tong child would have looked like as an adult, and it gives us a great view of at least what some of the overall pattern of variation looks like in Australopithecus africanus. However, there are a lot of other specimens coming from South Africa. Makapansgat is a cave site, similar kind of cave site, located in northern South Africa, perhaps the earliest of the South African cave sites in terms of its age, its geological age, maybe going back as old as three and a half million years, making it similar in age to the remains from East Africa that we've talked about. And again, what you see is the 
pattern of variation in terms of the dentition, the morphology, that's very much similar to the Australopithecus afarensis specimens we talked about earlier. We have large molars, expanded molars with very thick enamel. We have a reduced canine that's showing a high degree of apical wear on this specimen. So we're getting a lot of occlusal wear. And we actually can see on this specimen MLD 18 or Makapanska 18 that that flat wear extends all the way across all of the dentition. Uh, so this individual was clearly eating a diet that was very abrasive and was producing a lot of degradation of the teeth. Again, another reason perhaps why the thick enamel would have been involved feature to accommodate this kind of high strain diet. Another specimen from Makapan's gut, this one Makapan's gut 40, shows similar kinds of morphology. Uh, this time we have an expanding pattern of dentition with the M1 being smaller than the M2 being smaller than the M3, uh, but we have a similar pattern of overall variation. And one of the things you can see uh, at least a little bit in this view, is that the corpus itself, the mandible itself, is a very robust bone. This is still a very robust species of hominin. Here is another specimen. This one was discovered from the side of Chrome Dry, just a few miles or uh, less than that even from the cave side of Sturkfontein. This specimen was brought to Broom's attention in 1935, and he actually designated it as the type specimen of a new species of Australopithecus from South Africa, Australopithecus robustus, on the basis of the very large teeth. And you can see the P4 especially here. You can see how in dimensions it's many ways similar, in fact, to the M1. It's not quite as long, but it has a similar kind of breadth. Um, this is what we might refer to as being a highly molarized premolar in the sense that it looks very much like a molar in terms of its overall morphology. One of the questions that Broom was attempting to address in identifying this as Australopithecus robustus was how to interpret this big pattern of variation they were observing in these early South African assemblages. Was it indicative of one lineage that simply showed a high amount of diversity between males and females? Or did we in fact have multiple hominins present in these sites? And again, the challenge of the cave sites is that we're not entirely sure necessarily whether fossils found in the same cave were present at the same time. They may have been separated by a million or two million years. So one question is whether or not we see multiple lineages living at the same time in South Africa, perhaps Australopithecus africanus and Australopithecus robustus, or whether Australopithecus africanus gives rise to later species that might include Australopithecus robustus. So the question of how many species and how are those species ordered throughout time. Uh, moving forward, we can see here another example of that variation that we see from even just the side of Sturkfontein. Here we see the maxilla of Sturkfontein 17. Again, you can see a pattern of increasing size across the molar dentition with relatively small M1, a larger M2, and an M3 that's even a little bit bigger here if we reconstruct its full dimensions. So quite large teeth, even from the more gracile version of the South African specimens. Um, you can see the P4, um, again, is a very broad tooth. Um, it has a nice bicuspid morphology, however, much like our teeth today, but a very large premolar in many, many ways. Looking at this specimen in an anterior view, you can see some of that fragmentary nature of some of the South African specimens, as we only have part of the skull view visible here. But we can still reconstruct the overall morphology if we look at the side view of this specimen here, if we look at the profile of the face. Again, we have a very broad face across the midline here. The zygomatics extend out very far laterally, again corresponding to perhaps large masseter muscle situated right here and connecting into the ramus of the mandible. Um, we have a fairly broad palate, again a small nasal aperture, a specimen that in many ways is similar to the variation we see in STS-5, Mrs. Plez. Moving ahead, we see Sturkfontein 71, again a specimen that perhaps suggests the pattern of evolution through time at these sites. Sturkfontein 71 might be one of the youngest specimens from the South African caves, and arguably perhaps representative of a later species altogether, in this case representative even of a genus Homo species. So something much more like us. Uh, we still have a fairly broad zygomatic, but the overall robustness of the face has decreased. The breadth across this uh, midline of the face would actually be considerably smaller than what we see in those STS-5, for example, or STS-17. It's hard to look at the teeth in this image, but the teeth themselves actually also show less robusticity. There's less breadth across the supraorbital torus. There's an expanded glabellar region. There's less robusticity in the skull. All of these again correspond with a more derived morphology in this specimen, but still coming out of the same cave of Sturkfontein, though perhaps at a much later date. 
Other specimens from this site show again that variation. Here's a specimen coming from perhaps the earliest location within the Sturkfontein cave system. This is Sturkfontein 252. And if we look at the reconstructed dentition of this teeth, we see morphology that looks a lot again like specimens from East Africa, like Australopithecus afarensis. We have a very large canine that shows that big projecting diamond-like structure that we see in a lot of the Australopithecus afarensis specimens. We have very large billowing premolars that are broad and have this almost pillow-like morphology. Uh, we again have molars that are big but not huge. They're not super robust molars. And in this case, they're fairly even in size between the M1, the M2, and the M3. Viewed laterally, you can see that all this white material represents reconstructed. So this is a very fragmentary specimen, and we only have sort of glimpses of what the overall morphology would have looked like. But you can again see that this maxillary canine is a very large canine. This is a very primitive looking canine. So this is a specimen, again, that shows perhaps the earlier morphology of these early Australopithecus africanus remains that might go on to evolve into more gracile forms, perhaps even giving rise, perhaps, to genus Homo later in the time period. Eventually, however, specimens such as this specimen, Swartkrans 48, from the cave of Swartkrans, which is basically just across the valley from Sturkfontein, clearly identified that there were multiple species of hominids in southern Africa at the same time. This is one of the best known specimens that we associate with Australopithecus robustus, one of the lineage of robust Australopithecines. Now we're going to talk about the robust Australopithecines after the midterm next week in much more detail, but for now it's important to recognize that these specimens occurred perhaps at the same time, perhaps following the gracile Australopithecines in southern Africa, Australopithecus africanus. But the overall pattern of variation seen in these South African caves is tremendous. We see lots of variation. Variation in the dental morphology, variation in the facial morphology, even variation in the postcranial remains, which I haven't even gotten into talking about in this context, in this lecture. So there's a lot of variation. And the challenge in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, all the way into the 1960s, was how do we interpret that variation? Do these specimens represent male and female versions of the same lineage, or are they different lineages altogether? We now know fairly clearly that this is obviously something quite different, that the overall morphology of a specimen like this, Swartkrans 48, is indicative of a different kind of adaptive plan, arguably a different kind of ecological niche, than what we see in STS-5, Mrs. Plez, Australopithecus africanus. Now these specimens may have coexisted across time, or the lineages may have coexisted, but clearly we see a diversity of hominins associated here at the terminal Pliocene, that time period around two and a half million years of age. We'll talk next week more about this diversity. Now, one of the, again, the important things to keep in mind about the South African material is how influential it was to understanding patterns of variation. Much of this material was uncovered in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, prior to the beginning of extensive work in East Africa. The work by Lewis and Marion Leakey and colleagues in East Africa really begins to take off in the 1960s. So their understanding of fossil variation in large part comes from the work done by South African colleagues in the decades preceding their discovery of materials out of East Africa. So as we'll talk about in a couple weeks when we talk about the origin of Homo, Philip Tobias, who gives us the species Homo habilis, got his training in South Africa, spent his career in South Africa. So the variation we see within these South African cave systems, complex as it is, was essential for the development of our field in terms of developing theoretical ideas as to how we interpret variation, how much variation goes within a taxa, how those taxa might be adapted to their environment in terms of their diet, their ecology. So the South African material is incredibly important. The work started by DART, continued by Broom and Robinson, and continuing today with current individuals working in South Africa has been central to our understanding of human evolution, and central especially to our understanding of the evolution of the Australopithecines.